So this is a little instructional video on how to operate Lucy. Lucy's a vertical boiled 18 ton small shunting locomotive. And it's a little bit different from the larger engines that we operate on the MYMR. So we're just gonna go through some of the peculiarities, what the controls are, how to operate it, and just how to get the best out of this little loco. And then you'll have a great day on it, and the engine will perform and do what you want. So we'll go around it, we'll look at all the controls, and we'll make a start. So, we're in the cab. Um, completely different layout to a normal engine. The driver stands up here on the plinth and the fireman's down in the well down here. All the driver's controls are relatively conventional, they're just in a different place. So here we have the reverser, which is a normal full reverser with a lock. You can actually go slightly beyond the first catch, which is like turbo mode, but we just want to be in that there. You can just see it in that catch there. And the again. There's nothing to oil on that, so it's nice and easy. Here we have the vacuum brake handle, the vacuum application handle. Now there's no combined brake valve on this engine. It's a steam brake and it's a separate vacuum brake. The engine is steam braked, but obviously there's a vacuum brake for the train. So that's your vacuum brake application handle. This is your steam brake. Now the steam brake is interesting. Um, it's quite a simple carrot valve, but it works really, really well once you've got the hang of it. So in that position there, it is in the off and release position and, the, and, and it's to exhaust. So in the valve, you've got a, an exhaust port which runs up this pipe and up the side of the chimney outside. You'll find that when the engine's, when you're first starting to use the brake, you'll get a bit of water coming out the top. So just be a little bit aware of where you are, especially if you're near the public and you're turning it on for the first time. So it's in the exhaust position now, and then you have a running position, which is about there, and nothing will actually happen in that position. That's still off. To make the brake come on, what we actually do is we just apply a little bit of steam there and you can, you'll hear it going through into the cylinders and then that position around there is full on. It leaves off when it gets warmer. And then to release the brake, you have to go all the way back round again to that position there. So that is running position, that is on. And when you, if you hold it there, it holds a little bit of steam in the steam brake so it rubs slightly and then you can release it fully by there. It's quite a powerful brake, this engine stops really quickly. It's got two brake cylinders at either side. So you just have to be a little bit careful you don't pick the wheels up. Um, it is quite easy to do that. Um, but if you're, you know, you take the hang of it, you, you, you'll get the hang of it. Um, and what I generally find is that rub a little bit of brake, it'll start to slow down and then you can get it released again. And like I say, that'll go a little bit easier once it's warmed up. So that's the steam brake. Regulator's up here, again very simple, it's just a carrot valve, an inverted carrot valve in a cast iron body. We have an oil feed from the lubricator down below that feeds into the, the main steam pipe and it naturally lets just a little bit of oil into the carrot as well. Um, it doesn't, obviously you don't want oil in the boiler but it feeds on the downhill side but it does allow a little bit of oil on the carrot as well. Very simple, pull towards you to open, push forward to shut. Um, it is different this one to other cockerels. Most cockerels you push forward to open the regulator and pull it back to shut. But this one, for reasons unknown, it's this way around, you can't put it the other way. But actually, for, for what we're used to on the MYMR, it's actually quite good because that's how we normally operate an engine. We pull a regulator towards ourselves, A4s, bullies, K4s, they're all like that. You pull it towards yourself. So make sure that's shut on the morning. Um, we also have a, a chimney cap here. Um, and it's important we close this on the night because um, that's in the closed position, that's in the open position there. There's a lock on it to stop it opening when we're running. It's important you close that on the night because the boiler soon cools down. So we want to keep that shut on the night. So on the morning, open it, first job, last thing, shut it. Over here, we have the ejector and it's a very simple ejector it's a it's a lifting style like a water lifting style injector five millimeter cone um it's fairly easy to operate just crack it first let it warm up a little bit there's a drip valve at the front that lets the, the water out the system so just crack it first first time and then once it's once it's going just adjust the, the pressure till you've got 21 inches on the on the gauge over there which is just here and then we got the 
what I guess we call the manifold, although there's only two fittings on it. We've got a blower here on this side, which goes up to the top of the, the chimney there that sits above the blast pipe. That's essentially, it's, it's very similar to a normal blower on an engine. It's a proper ring with holes in it. Um, it's fairly effective, um, but less so at lower pressures. You're best not putting a blower on until you've got about three or four bar, because otherwise you're wasting more steam than you're gaining. So leave that till the, till the pressures come up. The engine, the, the boiler, naturally drafts very well anyway, um, because it's vertical, you don't get anything coming into the cab, um, so you don't really need it until the pressures come up a little bit. Yeah. So here we have the steam valve for the injector, which runs down to the top of the injector here. It's a restarting injector or a lifting injector. Um, we've got a, a, a throttle valve here, they call it, which is essentially in your live steam cone, there's like a needle valve in it, which moves in and out. And this controls that needle valve to get the injector started. Um, it's a little bit complicated inside. You guys don't need to worry about that. It works really well. So we'll demonstrate the injector in a bit, but that's your water valve, that's your throttle valve, and that's your steam valve. Just the three controls for the injector. There's an overflow down here. You can see it in that copper cone. And then that injector feeds into this clack. Now, there is a mark on top of the, 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 that, the, the valve here, the valve stem, that shows that it's in line. This handle, as you can see, is loose. And what I tend to do is in the on position, I'll leave the handle in that position. Because otherwise, in the off position there, it sticks out and gets in your way. So I tend to, to keep it open in that position there. But just, just, just double check that line there. Um, I'll, I'll maybe highlight it a bit better. Um, but uh, that's, that, that, that's open there. Up the top, in a slightly awkward place, I have to admit, well, that's where the boss was, is the steam heat valve. Steam heat, crack it open. Um, there's a gauge on here which is in PSI, nice and easy to read. It has a relief valve which is set at 50 PSI and the outlet for the relief valve is down here in the corner of the cab. And we'll demonstrate that, but it just blows a bit of steam out, you can hear it. It's not too savage, and that'll blow steam heat round your feet, and you'll be aware that you've got, uh, you've got, um, you're blowing off and you're at the maximum pressure. And next to the steam heat gauge, we've got the main pressure gauge. Now, the main pressure gauge is in atmospheres, which is very similar to bar, but again, three PSI by running it in atmospheres which is what the boiler was originally ran at when it was new, so I wanted to keep it right. So we're running in atmospheres. So we've roughly got 14 PSI for every, every bar, uh, every, every atmosphere on the gauge. It's fairly simple, one to 10, 10 it blows up on the red mark. Um, and then, so you've got, you know, 50, 15 pounds per square inch for every, for every atmosphere. It's got, non ross pop valves on. Um, they're very simple, a bit like a Great Western valve. So you do get, it does start to feather um, about nine and a half atmospheres before fully blowing up at 10. And then it takes similar to shut as well. They're pretty good at the moment, but don't expect the full pop like a normal ross pop valve. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's one to 10. Um, the engine will move quite happily from five bar onwards and you've got a good break at that point. Um, but obviously, if you're steam eating, you want to be running between sort of eight and 10, 10 atmospheres. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it, 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 there's no need to run it right up at nine and a half if you're just maneuvering around. Coal bunkers in here. Um, it holds 650 kilograms of coal. Fire irons, there's three fire irons, bent dart, a rake and a shovel. Um, and that's all you need on this. And they live on the engine because I've cut them to the right length for the engine. 
made a little shovel bracket here to, to, to hang your shovel on and then there's a little coal chute here a simple access to the coal out fire old door's got a little chain on it pull it open like that throw your fuel on then you can shut it again with a cap like that and there is a little uh, Boise's vest up there to hang the chain on to keep it off the floor. Um, while we're down here, we've got steam brake lubricator, similar to what's on the Black 5, fairly straightforward. Make sure the brake is off before you open it. Screw the little bung out, pour some steam oil into it till it stops. Just carefully, just gently nip the bung back up again. Doesn't blow by at the moment, so there's no need to rav on that. Just a little nip, job done. There's no bean tins over the top of it yet. Here we have the other clack, and this is for the water pump. The water pump is down on the left hand side and it's driven off the cross head. And again, like the other side, I generally leave this one open and the handle in the vertical position is the clack open. Again, if it sticks out here, you hit your ankle on it and it, it's in the way. So I leave it up for open, down for off. I haven't been turning that one off at the moment. It doesn't pass by. There's another check valve in the pump, so this generally stays in the, in the closed position and we've got a vacuum relief valve down here the other important handle drain cox that lives over there it's a simple push it down with your foot and then it's especially designed you can't get your foot back under it again so you have to pull it back up with your hand up is open down is shut simple as that handbrake over here now the handbrake on this engine isn't the best um, it operates two independent blocks on the rear axle. Make sure you fully unwind it because otherwise it can reduce the, the, the side control of the rear, the rear wheel set. I mean, it doesn't have a lot, it's only an 040, but we do find it causes the boxes to run a little bit warm on the back if you're not careful. So when you take the handbrake off, fully off. Nothing can drop off or apart underneath. It, it has a stop, it has a physical big stop, so you can wind it fully off. And just give it a little nip and then it won't wind itself on when you're driving along and then over just back to the driver's side again we have the two water pump controls which we'll show later on we'll, we'll do a demonstration when we're running we've got a bleed valve down here which blows the air out of the water pump that is in the closed position at the moment that is in the open position so we, when we when we when we want to turn the pump on we go up to the water handle up here on the top of the tank. That's in the closed position. We push that handle forward and water will start to flow into the water pump. Once it's flowing in, open that. And as we're obviously moving along, it'll blow any air out the side. You'll see like a water pistol jet out the side of the engine. Once that's just nice pure water, you can close it. And that's it, the pump's running. As you're going along, you'll hear it, the clacks, banging away down near your feet it makes quite a bit of noise um, and, it, and it pumps the water in it does pump the water in quite quickly um, and advise we don't really use it above 10 mile an hour um, it's a 15 mile an hour maximum speed locomotive this um, so the, the pump running at 10 mile an hour is fine um, we generally prefer to use the injector because it's putting hot water in um, whereas this injector this, this water pump just pumps stone cold water in but to turn it off, you just simply pull the handle back to that position there and the pump will stop. Simple as that. We've actually got a sand valve down here. It's, it's a gravity sands. You pull that out and the sands come on, you push it back in, they, they, they go off. I haven't actually used it yet. We, we've tested it, but we've not put any sand in the sandbox at the moment until we decide if it needs it. But if we do need it, there'll be sand in the boxes. You pull the handle out and it feeds between the two driving wheels so it works in either direction nice and simple great big sandbox on the front so starting the oiling up fairly simple takes about 15 minutes not too long we'll go around the outside of the local because it is slightly different on each side we'll oil it up what i generally find you need for oiling up is a squirt the oil can makes it nice and easy and we've got a conventional feeder as well just for some of the bigger pots that speeds it up a little bit We'll just leave that on there for the moment. First thing we'll start with at this end is we've got little oil pots for the valve glands and the piston glands. Now throughout the day, you'll need to regularly top these up. 
and you can if it's hot and you're doing a lot of work you can put steam oil in these because it does it does disappear quite quickly um, no problem with that you can mix a bit of steam oil and bearing oil for what it's doing so like I say if, you, if you're going on quite a run you're better off with uh, better off with steam oil but on a nice cold morning like this you doing a bit of steam eating we just put a bit of normal bearing oil in so you've got oil pot there and an oil pot on there now one that's easy to miss is right around the back here and on the valve guides there's three holes and you just see that one there we top that up with a bit of oil there and then there's one there and then there's one on the back as well which is really difficult to see we just pour a little bit of oil into that and that's enough for the valve guides there then coming on the top of the combination lever we've got two little oil holes here and two little oil holes there they aren't oil holes them ones they're where taper pins are to go in that i haven't put in yet don't worry about that it can't come out because it's trapped in by this but then we have a little oil pot on the top here just top that up normal trimming in it like all oil pots we try and keep it nice and clean put the lid back down again that's done then on the bottom of the combination lever union link we've got a little oil hole just in there and then we've got one there just a small blob of oil there then we've got a bigger pot up on top of the cross head and that's where I use the larger feeder just because it speeds the job up a little bit again we're not using a huge amount of oil at the moment on steam heat so I'm not going to fill it right up because otherwise it will just leak everywhere that's it and then I tend to just like we do on engines just put a little bit on the slide bars just to give it a head start it's a cast iron cross head and steel slide bar so there's no white metal um, so it does like like plenty of oil so moving a little bit further back most of the brake gear pivot points have a tiny little oil hole in the top you can see it there you just put a blob of oil in the top like that and that just keeps the brake gear nice and free um, some of them are a little bit hard to find it's a bit of a challenge there's, an, like, there's another one down here you can try and find them all it helps it keeps the brake gear nice and free so that's that's where we've got to there the brake cylinder is here one each side um, very importantly there's a drain on the brake cylinder here and that's very important for frost protection because otherwise the, the brake cylinder can fill up with water especially if the valve passes a little bit the brake cylinder is nominally down for off when you put steam in the steam comes through this copper pipe and it pushes the piston up and pulls the brakes on so at the start of the shift we crack the steam brake open we leave that drain open we let it warm up and we blow any water out let it run for 30 seconds or so and then you can shut that drain but it's really important that them drains are shut before you go off shed and you've warmed the brake up because otherwise you've potentially got reduced braking force so it is important that they're shut so moving back a little bit again we've got another little oil point just on the brake gear there it's a tiny little hole that's it we top that up and then i think there's one just down there that's it little oil pot there so that's that then we've got expansion link and the die block now even though it doesn't look it where that bolt is there in the top of that in in the die block is there's a little oil hole under that so that's kind of like a little well so we always put fill that little chamber up there where that bolt goes through with a bit of oil and then what i tend to do is i just tend to put a bit of oil straight onto the the faces of the of the expansion link like that rub a little bit on gets a little bit of oil gets a head start so that's that we've then got round here we've got the rear brake hanger again it's just a little oil hole in the top we'll speed a little bit of oil in and that's it you don't need a lot then at the back of the die block we've got another tiny little oil hole We'll just put a little blob of oil in that and then up there on the top somewhere there we are not the easiest to see again we've got a little oil hole there and then on the drive shaft 
for the expansion link. Normally you have a, a return crank that drives your, your, your expansion link on Walshart's valve gear. This is a little bit unusual in that it has a, an, a, an eccentric on the inside which drives it. So there's a shaft that comes through the frame. There's some little cast iron bearings on that and they each one has a little lid and they have a little oil pot in them with a trimming. So we top them up, make sure the lid's shut because we don't want any crap in there. There's a little oil, this one you can get just through the frame like that. And again, we'll just fill that one up. And I find it easiest with a pumpy oil can. We end up with a nice big strong thumb at the end of oiling this up. But uh, it's just easier than the big, big feeder for a lot of it. Just put the finger in, shut the lid again, and that's it. So what we can do now is while we're here, that's, oh, nearly missed it. There's another one up on the way shaft up here. Another one of these ones with the flippy lid. Put a bit of oil in it. I'm just gonna run a bit down there. Give it a head start. Again, shut the lid. So that's it, oiled up down this side by the side rods. Side rods are pretty simple. You unscrew this little grub screw, try not to lose it. And then I generally find the feeders quickest for this. And then we just feed the oil in. Nice and cold this morning. There we go. And what we do is we keep feeding that in till it comes out of this hole here. There's a hole either side of the top of the oil pot, which is a little bit weird. And I, I, I can only assume it's like an air hole to let the oil flow down. And it also lets a bit of oil out for the thrust faces as well. But it's a little bit strange compared to a normal engine. You can just see the oil running out there. So that's it. They don't take a huge amount of oil. And again, if you were doing a long run with this engine, you would have to top these up throughout the throughout the trip. Um, it's an industrial shunter. It's not designed to be running long distances um, without the oil being replenished. Just bear that in mind. It's not an A4, it's not a V1. It's, it's not got oil pots that'll last the full day. Um, quite happily go up and down to Gothland and back um, if I was going all the way to, to, to Pickering, I'd probably check them um, just 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 at Levisham, just give it a top up say, just keep an eye on it um, because they will soon they will soon deplete with, of oil quite quickly. But for normal slow speed running around the yard, a bit of steam eating will quite happily last uh, all day. There is a trimming under them caps as well. Taking a little bit more oil. Are you going to retrieve our crew for the uh, I don't, I was going to, oh, Barney's here. The only thing is that you haven't brought a look at Right, and then <laughs> the leading coupling wheel, same again, there's a little oil pot. Can be a little bit tricky to, to get in this one. You might have to set the engine. But again, we've got a little oil pot down there. Doesn't make too much mess. But. And that's it, it's coming out the little holes at the side, so that's enough. Put the screw back in. Give it a little nip. That's it. So that's that side of the engine oiled up. So now we're on to the other side. Set that with me. So the difference around this side is we've got the water pump to oil up. But again, we'll start at this end. We'll take the caps off. Soften it up. And while you're oiling it up, it's always just making sure that all the securing bolts and split pins are in, nothing looks obviously loose with the split bearings. They do move around a little bit, but... 
generally fine. Like I say, these caps slide on top of the. So just be aware if you've seen one that looks like it's moved off, sliding out, let a fit in on, they'll, uh, they'll nip it back up again. Which basically involves a ball pain hammer. They just peen slightly. See it appearing at the oil well. Put that back in. So they do take a, you know, they do take a, a decent amount of oil. But like I say, it won't, it won't last all day. There's those strange holes in the side of the pot. There's only four corks on the whole engine. squirty oil can so we've got the little cast iron bearing oil pot on top of the weigh shaft just give that some blobs of oil top it up that's it there's a trimming in there make sure the lid's shut again back of the expansion link die block we've got a little oil all there we've got an oil on the link oil oil on the top above and while we're here again we've got one on the brake hanger just there bit of oil in that, that's it. And we can go down to these pots on the drive shaft for the expansion link and top them up. Trim in. Shut that. And then the slightly more difficult one to reach that just lives in there. And we'll just top that up with a bit of oil. There we go, that's that done. A little bit small fingers out, so you can always reach them on the inside if you, if you can't get them down again. Again, oil in the top of the, what is the die block in there. And again, we can put a bit of oil on the, the faces of the, the expansion link itself. Front and back, let's put a bit of oil on there. I think down here, there's a, uh, Oil hole on the brake gear. Where are you, little finger? There we are. That's got it. We've got that there. And then again, we've got an oil hole on that brake hanger there. Now, again, on this side, with your water pump, there's nothing to oil on the water pump, on the actual pump itself. There is on the gland, but here there's nothing. Again, we've got a drain valve for the brake cylinder on this side. Open at the moment because we haven't warmed it up. But it's very important after you've blown the brakes through and warmed them up that you come round and shut them valves because otherwise, like I say, you'll have reduced braking force. We'll do a demonstration of that in a minute. I always like to put a little bit of oil, just pour a little bit of oil on the ratchet just to help reduce wear and then give it a few turns. like that. So when it comes to the lubricator, you take steam oil, 680, Morris 680. There's an indicator gauge on here. We've got plenty of oil for what we're going to be doing today. These are the feed adjusters. Don't touch them because they're set. Um, don't try undoing them. They're important. You can see the three feed pipes off the top. And then what we have is a slightly well-fitting wooden lid like that 
and then you just simply pour the steam oil in the top. You can just get the can in, top it up. It, the, the lubricator does use quite a bit of oil. I've got it set reasonably high, um, so keep an eye on it. But fairly simple. Top it up with 680 steam cylinder oil. Try and keep it all clean, keep the lid clean. Give it a prime for 30 seconds on the morning and that way you'll get some oil head start into the cylinders and up to the regulator. And that's it nice and simple. There's check valves in it, it's all like a normal lubricator. We have an oil pot on here, which hasn't used a lot since yesterday. And then there's a tiny little oil hole in there as well. I think it's an oil hole, so I'll put some in it. Um, we've got an oil pot on top of the cross head on this side. Slightly smaller than the other side, but does the same job. That feeds the slide bars and the little end pin. Same as the one on the other side. And again, I like to just give a little bit of a head start on the slide bars, just like that. Perfectly placed side rod to get to this side. Over right here. Set this one up. Quite small holes to get the oil into. But I do find that it's easier with the feeder than a, a squirty oil can. Otherwise your thumb, thumb aches by the time you've got it filled. There we go, just to say coming out, put the screw back in. And back to the squirty oil can, we just put a little bit in the top of that brake hanger there, in the hole. Keeps that nice and lubricated. Um, again, bottom of the union link, got a little oil hole there, and the same bottom of the combination lever there. You can if you want, put a little bit of oil on the Piston rod gives it a head start. Again, we've got a little oil well up here. Top that up. What we'll do is the two in the back here, these two little ones here, a little bit of oil in there, and then the ones that are easy to forget round the back of the valve guide three little holes and the just on the end there that's it top up the valve guide lubricator that one and put a bit of line on the valve drive itself and rod and again the one for the piston rod again like you say if it's a hot day you're doing a lot of mileage you can always put steam oil in these, nothing else, just these, because they do consume quite a bit of oil. Then the only other thing to mention, the globe valves on top of the cylinders here, they're only for display purposes, they're not used. They were on originally, um, and that's how you lubricate the valves and pistons, but we've now got a mechanical pump, so don't put any oil in the top, because it will just sit there, it won't go anywhere. So yeah, they're purely for, for visual. Feel free to give them a polish if you want, but don't stick any oil in. The only other thing, just to note, is there is tiny little oil holes in the valve guide and the valve drive. So they're very, very tiny, but if you just basically put a, a little bit of oil on the on the drive for the, the lubricator. So on this engine, we've got the eccentrics, the two eccentrics on the inside that drive the, the um, expansion link. They're obviously underneath, they originally had four little oil pots, two on each eccentric. I've got rid of them, I've made it a little bit easier so that we can oil this engine without a pit. Um, and what I've done is I've, I've put a, a four feed oil pot on the inside of the frames. We've still got our paint in here at the moment. But if you look inside, you can just see an oil pot sticking up there. 
with a lid just down from the water filler and that that is a four feet wick lubricator that feeds down some flexible pipes down to the eccentrics it seems to work quite well so it's fairly easy you keep filming there what happens i'll put it on the side Into the All we do is with our finger, we flip the lid up like that and we pour some oil into that. It's quite a large oil pot actually, um, but we want the eccentrics to remain nicely lubricated as they flail around. Um, and it, it's just so that when it, if it ever ends up anywhere where there isn't a pit, you can just simply reach in and oil it up. And through these hatches as well, you can also get the um, the rear axle boxes as well. It's a little bit fiddly that though, but you can do it, especially if you're my size. Um, but we won't do that today because we've got a piss up there. Top this up with oil. Move it along over the top of each feed. do is for what we're doing today. If you were doing a normal service you'd fill that right up to the top. And then just make sure you shut the little latch. So the water tank is up here at the front of the engine. This is the front water tank sandbox. I've got it on the drawing despite popular belief. Cylinders at the rear, water tanks at the front. 750 gallons of water. It's very economical on water is this engine, it doesn't use a lot um, and, and in relation to the amount of water in the tank to what's in the boiler it's quite a lot of water because obviously the boiler doesn't hold as much water as the normal engine, it's a lot smaller. Two fillers either side, make sure they're back down. You can fill it from a water column um, but I've just been topping it up with a hose pipe because like I say it doesn't take very long. Sandbox is on the top, you simply lift the lid up put the sand in, shut it again, obviously try not to get sand in the water or anything like that and also around there you can also see we've got a little shut off for the pressure gauge there so should you ever need to isolate the pressure gauge, fairly unlikely but there is a little isolation there on the back of the boiler one lamp bracket at the top, I might put some more on lower down yet but I ain't got round to that at the moment there's not a lot else up here but that's it, top your water up, make sure you've got plenty of water before you go but like I say, it doesn't use a huge amount, it's very economical. Right, so we're getting ready to move. We've got heading up towards five atmospheres now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dry the brake out a little bit. We've got the drains on either cylinders down at the bottom, open at the moment. So I'm just going to bring the handle round to that position. And then I'm just going to put a breath of steam on like that. And you can hear it, you can just start to hear it go through and it'll start to blow out the bottom. So what we'll do is we'll go down the cylinders now and once they look like they're just running nice steam and they're warmed up, we'll turn the isolations off. So you can hear it there, it's flowing through, it doesn't take long, almost by the time you put out the tab, it's warm the great cylinder up, so we just simply and carefully, without burning yourself, we just, we just turn that off. You will hear a little bit of a blow, that's out the exhaust of the cylinder, but that's okay, but as long as that one's turned off, and then the same on the other side. We've got the other handle here. Again, you can go either up or down. We can go down in this case. There we are. I'll put a wooden handle on that at some point. But that's it. That's the brake dried out and the drain just shut. Um, so that's it round the outside. Side rods, little pots. Um, it's all fairly straightforward, easy enough to do. Um, let's say, whole job takes about 20 minutes. So we should have enough steam now. We'll go onto the top pit and we'll show you the axle boxes and what's the oil underneath. And then we can release the brake. 
what you can do to make the brake a little bit easier to you can just put a little bit of oil around the top there and then you can hear it so that's like I say that's the running position if you're driving along you're best putting the brake back into that position again so it's ready for use if it's round here and you're driving and you want the brake it's a little bit harder to get it on so once you've finished an application put it back to here again it's in a logical position you can hear the brakes come on there and the steam underneath and then to release it you can hear it release it as well and like i say just be careful the first few times because it blows steam up and cold water out this chimney until it's warmed up you don't want to soak everyone you can feel this is freeing up already now so on that traps the steam in the cylinders they will die off and the brakes fall off but that's the release position there and then we leave it back in the running position there at the moment so we've got enough steam to safely move now let's clear down your side Thanks very much. Yep. so the first thing we can do is just put the brake on a little bit just rub it on then we can take the handbrake off and fully off like that there we are release the brake make sure the cocks are open like on any engine forward gear pull the toilet chain which is also a whistle and then what I like to do is I just like to crack a bit of steam into the cylinders the regulator certainly at the moment not that it'll stay like this doesn't blow by at all um, so I like just to warm the cylinders up a little bit because they're obviously stone cold on the morning like this morning and You can hear, a bit like the S15, you can hear the steam passing down the main steam pipe here Obviously that gets hot, don't touch it But it's just cracking open air at the moment and we can just, just hear the steam passing down And when you look at the drain cock, you start to see a little bit of water just coming out Let's give it a little bit more and we're off. Just the so there's no first or second valve, it's just a carrot valve, but it moves quite easily and just give it a breath of steam. And like I say, you can hear it when you've got steam on as well. No steam chest pressure gauge. We're up onto the pit, and the only thing we've got left to do is the four axle boxes. And because it was out yesterday, it was only on TV. They're not going to take a lot of oil from there, but it is important that we fill them out the boxes up full. If it's doing more mileage, we use quite a lot of uh, we use quite a lot of, of oil in the box. And the bronze axle boxes, they're not white metal axle boxes. So you can feel we put the brake into that position and it does stop quite quickly if we want it to. Like that. And then release. It doesn't roll as easy as a normal engine, so you can release it and brake on like that. Simple as that. So we're underneath the engine. There is a cork in top of this plate that lives on top of the axle box, which we can take out. And we would normally use a hurdy gurdy um, because it, it, but because we haven't used a huge amount of oil um, on this turn, the boxes are still quite full. So we can just fill these chambers that are inside the top of these axle boxes up absolutely full. So that little oil hole there, I'll just lift the lid up and see if we can see into it. I can unstick it without breaking the finger there. There we go. In there is the chamber that we fill up with oil. You come around that way and you'll be able to get the camera and the light up. That's it. You can see it filling the chamber up there. There's a fair bit of oil in that at the moment. So that'll do us. But that, that, there's two wicks in there and they feed through the top of the crown. There is an underkeep in here with a drain so we can check, check, check let any water out. 
it's important that we have them top boxes absolutely full because like I say the bronze bearing and they're not as tolerant to uh, low oil as a white metal bearing. Same on the other side we can lift it up or you can take the cork out depending on what position it's in and we can just make sure that we've got oil in there. So if you, you, the more mileage you do the more oil they use and you can also while we're doing this you can see the flexible stainless pipes that feed the eccentrics and it works well actually it was a bit of an experiment but it saves having to get under here and fill little oil pots up and obviously the top oil pot's bigger as well um, so yeah that's full enough for what we're doing today but yeah i always fill them absolutely full the other slightly tricky thing to oil is the end the ends of the um the eccentrics here there's a little oil hole in here what I tend to do is I just give that whole area a good dose of oil around that pin. Um, it's quite tricky to get to, and obviously there's one on the other side as well. There we go. Like that. I'll just give them a good covering on oil. Right, we'll go down the other end, and we'll do the same principle with the rear axle boxes. They're just a little bit harder to access um, and you've got to be careful that you don't burn yourself on the steam pipes as well but we make sure we've got plenty of oil in these so I put a cork in but it can be a little bit easy just to lift the lid up to be honest And when you fill these up, if you fill them right up to the top, they overflow ever so slightly, and then that little bit of oil oils the horn guides. But if you're not not filling them right to the top, you can uh, you can you need to make sure you get a little bit of oil on the horn guides as well. And the same on the last one on this side. Like that. The feed are in. Let's see. Normally, if you've got to put a lot in, you can use the herdy gurdy for these. It's a lot quicker and easier. So we're not, not putting a huge amount of oil in these today. So nearly full. That's a warm under here. The freezing cold dirt. That's it, that'll do for what we want. Let's pull up to the top. There. Now there is, actually, thinking about it, there is two small oil holes on the brake wear shaft there. No, no, not that small. So there's a, one there, one on there. That's it. And then if you want to put a little bit of oil on the screw for the handbrake, won't do any harm. Keep everything nicely lubricated. And that's it for underneath. We're done. We're ready for off shed. the steam heat valve there just gently at first obviously we're eating a, a full train so uh, it'll take a while to, to warm up but you'll eventually start to see the gauge rise there with a little bit of pressure on to steam heating right so this is the water pump and pumps water in the boiler via the left hand cross head very simple that's the relief valve on the top there that 
copper pipe coming down round here in a loop in the bottom with the drain valve on it is the feed into the water pump and then the delivery is this pipe here that goes up to the clack so on the morning when we're prepping it to make it to, to set it ready for operation we need to make sure that this drain tap here is closed which it is at the moment you see we drain it there it drains a little bit of water out but before we go into traffic on the morning you just need to make sure that that drain tap is horizontal like that and it's shut and that's it down here for the water pump there's nothing else to do um, we can see the, the little bleed here, which we operate from the cab via this rod, and that just bleeds any air out um, when we first use it. And there's a little oiling point on the gland here with a little oil pot there and a little hole there that I don't really know what it does, but I stick a bit of oil in it just for extra fun. But uh, that's a water pump in itself, dead simple. So open the cab to make the water pump operate. Obviously, we need the engine in motion. We have two controls in the cab for the water pump. We have the bleed, which we just saw down, down on, the, uh, on, on the pump itself, operated via the rod. You can operate it with your foot. That's in the closed position. That's in the open position there. So you just leave it in that position when you're not doing anything and it's shut. And then the water valve on top of the tank is there and that's in the closed position. There's an O and an F, but that's French. But uh, that's, that's, that's in the closed position there. And then to turn it on, you put it into that position there. You can hear a lot of bubbles going. So to operate the water pump, we need to get the engine going. Check the handbrakes off, like that. So we're in motion. So the first thing we do is we open the drain tap down there and we open the water. And then out the side, you will see water squirting out of the drain tap, like that. Once it looks just like a nice set of solid water, you don't need to run it for long. You can shut the drain tap and that's it. We're going along and the pump's running. You can hear carefully, if I shut up, you can hear the clack going up and down. in there. It's quite loud actually the banging. Yeah that clunking. So if we turn the pump off it stops. Open it back up again. You'll hear the clunking start. Need a little bit of speed on. And that's it, and to knock the water pump off, you simply close the handle. Once you've primed it, you don't need to keep priming it if you're using it fairly regular. You can just leave that little drain tap down there in the closed position. And obviously the important thing is also, as part of the setup when we're doing it, is that you make sure that this clack is open here. And that's the open position with the handle upright. If you don't have the clack open, the only place for the water to go when you start moving is out of the relief valve. And it copes with so much water, but after a while it, it tends to, it tends to, it can't cope and it can blow the joints out. And also anyone on the outside gets soaked. And again, and we'll drop back, just bear in mind that you are squirting water, which can be a little bit rusty if it's sat for a while, out the side of the engine. So if you, if you like the people that have stood down the side of the engine, or the members of the public, I would strongly suggest that you, you're just careful where you're opening it. So we'll do it once more. We'll get it rolling backwards. Get a little bit of speed up. Shut the regulator, open the water. There's the pump in action and you can hear it. Dunk, 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 dunk. And I haven't primed it that time. But I'll show you the prime again out of this side. You can see it squirting out there. But we'll shut that. You can hear the clack running. And then to turn it off, 
simply turn it like that and everything goes nice and quiet again and it's as simple as that obviously the water pump pumps stone cold water into the boiler so it is preferable that really most day to day you use the injector because it's better for the boiler but obviously on shed you do need to make sure before you go off and do your duties that the water pump's working but other than that that's it so at the end of the day when it comes to disposal it's really really easy because obviously there's no smoke box so we don't have to worry about digging that out and what i generally find is that we push the fire forward use the bent dart to get the fire out from below the fire roll door and then use the straight rake push all the fire give it a bit of a rake so some of it falls through the bars and push it all to the front the bars are quite there's quite a decent gap between them on this engine because obviously it needs plenty of air through the fire because there isn't a lot of, 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 of secondary air it's nearly all primary so when you come to, to dispose give it a good rake leave some at the front and that'll just sit there glowing and then you simply go underneath and clean the ash pan out and then the following day when we lighten the engine up we just shovel out using the clinker shovel we just shovel the remaining bits of embers out and, and ash out that's from the night before so there's no need to start digging it all out on the night and throwing it out it's only a small boiler it doesn't have a huge amount of water in it in, in relation to its heating surface so we want to try and keep it as warm as long as possible once the embers have died down then you park back up in the shed and even if it's the, the fires are glowing just, just gently going, you can still tuck the chimney cap. There's a bit of a gap there that lets any, any excess gases out. Providing it's not roaring away, and it's just, just glowing embers at the front, then just shut the chimney cap. And that'll keep the engine nice and warm for the following day if it's out. Or if it's not, it still keeps it nice and warm and just allows it to cool that bit slower. So when emptying the ash pan is dead easy. There's a little gate catch on this flat here. And then we can simply lift that out of the way, it lifts out. And then we simply get a rake and we rake the ash pan out. So once you've got the bulk of it out, you can uh, you can put a bit of water in there and rake it round if you so wish. But we just pull it out the front like that. Obviously, if you do use water, avoid hitting the fire bars like you would any engine. That's it to, to rake the fire out at the end of the day. Nice and simple like that. We just keep going till the ash pan's nice and clear. That'll do you for that. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I want to get going. Then so put it back in. Simply drop it down in there. Make sure it's fully down. Then put the little, little gate lock back in. Push it down. Job done. Simple as that. But yeah, that's it really. It's uh, it's pretty simple to operate. A little bit different. Um, but I hope you enjoy it. Like I say, any questions, just see a member of staff or, or, or contact myself um, and I'll let you know anything you need to know. But the important thing is you enjoy it and, and, and have fun.